So our speakers today, Ned Block and Jacqueline Gottlieb, are going to make presentations respectively about the philosophy and science of consciousness. And then they're going to sit down for a conversation with the philosopher of science, Massimo Bliucci, who's sitting between them right now. Um, so without further ado, now I'm going to introduce Dr. Bliucci, who's going to take over the Henley event tonight. Thank you. Massimo Bliucci is the chair of the philosophy department at the City University of New York at Lehman College. Before going to Lehman, Massimo was professor of ecology and evolution at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. His research is concerned with the philosophy of science, the relationship between science and philosophy, and the ever-interesting relationship between science and religion. He has published over 100 technical papers and several books. He has columns in the magazines Philosophy Now and Skeptical Inquirer. He pens the Rationally Speaking blog and hosts a podcast by the same name. And his most recent book is titled Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Book. Thank you, Masmo Bidji. Thank you for being here. That's very short. Um, and I, I'll, I'll do the same. I'll briefly introduce the two speakers. Uh, you guys are here to listen to them, not to us doing introductions. So I'll, I'll get right down to it. And as Michael said, after their talks, which will be about 15 or 20 minutes each, um, we will um, have first, uh, I'll ask, I'll, I'll take the prerogative of being the moderator essentially and ask the first couple of questions. And then after that, we'll just open it uh, to the general discussion. So, to my left is Jacqueline Gottlieb, who is Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Columbia University. Uh, her specialization is on the neural mechanisms of attention, learning, and decision making. She's interested in uh, understanding how the brain generates intelligent behavior, what it does, and in particular how it learns, reasons, and makes adaptive decisions. Her most recent publications, just to give you a flavor of what she's working on, include a paper on spatial and non-spatial information in the parietal lobe in current opinion in neurobiology. A paper in attention as a decision in information space and trends in cognitive sciences, and one on how reward modulates attention independently of action value in the posterior parietal cortex in the journal neuroscience. To my right is Ned Block, who is Silver Professor of Philosophy, Psychology, and Neural Science at NYU. He works in philosophy of mind and foundations of neuroscience and cognitive science, and he's currently writing a book on attention. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a recipient of fellowship from the National Endowment of the Humanities and the National Science Foundation, among others. He's a past president of a lot of things, including the Society for Philosophy and Psychology, and he's also past president of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. He's co-editor of The Nature of Consciousness, Philosophical Debates, published by MIT Press and the first one of two volumes of his collected papers entitled Functionalism, Consciousness, and Representation has also been published by MIT Press. Please welcome both of our speakers. <laughs> and the first one up is John. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Um, so the big topic of today is consciousness, but I think that we will confine ourselves to one aspect of consciousness, uh, which is uh, visual perception, sort of our sense of visual awareness. Um, and, um, and so to, to introduce this topic, uh, what I'd like to do in the next 15, 20 minutes is give you an overview of the visual system, of how we see, um, how vision happens from inside the brain. So I'll, I'll talk about the mechanisms, the pathways, the brain pathways that give rise to vision, and, in, and then I will end with how we think uh, awareness or self-awareness may arise in this system. Um, so, okay, if there's one message that I'd like to convey in, um, in this time is that the act of seeing, um, it feels sometimes passive to us, we just open our eyes and see, but it is very much an active process. Um, it, is, it is something that's constructed actively by our brain. So see, seeing begins with photons, and photons are in and of themselves dead things. They're just packets of energy, you know, they come from out there in outer space. Outer space is dead matter. It's just the physical input. So in order to make this come alive, the brain has to, first of all, sense those photons, and I, we'll see that this is not automatic to begin with. It has to put them together and see what speck of light goes with what. It has to give meaning to some shape that it extracts from the world. 
it has to decide what to do, given that it decided what that thing is. And finally, it has to do something about it. And action, um, ultimately, all we can do is move a muscle in the body. We can learn and form memories, but that's ultimately preparation for a delayed action. All right, so only after we have all these things happening can we get a living sentient being uh, from this um, physical, purely physical stimulation. All right, so this process begins at the eye, and it's a very innocent looking organ, but in fact it's a very formidable gateway to our uh, awareness uh, because it already determines what you will see. And we all know we see only a portion of the wavelengths that are out there in the environment. For example, we don't see infrared radiation. Um, and this you can think about it, you can think of as a sort of evolutionary decision. Um, something has decided, perhaps ev evolution, that we don't need, given our lifestyle and the environments that we live in, we do not need to see certain things, we do not need to hear certain things, we can get along fine without them. And of course, for other animals, evolution has made other decisions about what they need to sense. All right, so many of you may be seeing this, uh, this slide of how an image is projected on the retina, and I'm sorry for these um, PowerPoint squiggles, I just mean to, to show that there are many things out there that we we just don't even react to. But the things that we do react to, the eye captures here on the retina. And the image that is captured on the retina is a very, very strange thing. And it's nothing like what you think you see. So if you have an image here, it is inverted. It is flat. It is double, because a given thing projects slightly differently on your two eyes. And it moves all the time, because your eyes are moving all the time. So if you just took a camera and recorded all of this, just like your retina records it, all you would see is a blur. You cannot make sense of it. So the task of the brain, then, is to make sense of this blur. All right, so the first thing that happens is in the pathways from the retina going up to the brain, and this is here the, in the back of the brain, we have a large area that's called the primary visual cortex, and this is the main recipient of visual information. There's also an intermediate relay station in, an, um, in a nucleus that we call the lateral geniculate nucleus. So the first part of constructing a visual scene happens in the connections. The connections from the two eyes sort themselves out, so they make a little more sense of the world. So what happens in the eye is that, for example, something that is here in the left visual field will fall on the far or the outer portion of the right eye, we call it the temporal portion, and will follow the inner portion of the left eye, we call it the nasal portion. So fibers from these two areas then sort themselves, and there's a very intricate molecular guidance mechanism going on here. Somehow they know to go to the right visual cortex. Okay, so what you have then in the right visual cortex, you have brought together, oh I'm sorry, this should be the left visual field. So you brought together the left visual field regardless of whether it's the uh, right or left eye. Right? But the converging information from the right or left eye also begins to give information about how far away those things are, depth perception. Um, in, in their slight mismatches between the positions of an image, uh, is one clue to depth. Okay, and the same thing happens on the other side. Sorry, the right visual field goes to the left uh, visual cortex. All right, so now we have uh, uh, things organized by hemifield. Um, and so now let's look what happens in the visual cortex. How does your primary visual cortex see the world? And the study of this was really revolutionized by uh, two uh, scientists named uh, uh, Hubel and Weasel, um, who uh, received the Nobel Prize for this work. They recorded the activity of individual neurons in the visual cortex. This is in anesthetized animals. And they found that these neurons are driven best by very simple things, oriented bars, small line segments of particular orientations. And also they found that neurons in this, areas, in this area have very small, what we call, receptive field. 
That means every cell sees only a tiny portion of the visual world, of the, of the retina, of the uh, retinal world. So let's say you have a receptive field like this, and you take a bar and you move it like that, so this, uh, what is shown here is the uh, electrical activity of one neuron in the visual cortex. So the, um, whenever there's a line, the neuron gives a spike. You can think about this as bits of information that the neuron gives up. So you can see that this particular cell likes a bar that's oriented um, like this, obliquely to the left. It, if you, if you uh, turn the bar around a little bit, the cell responds less and eventually becomes quiet, right? Either way. So if you can plot this, if you plot the firing rate as a function of orientation, you get these tuning curves. So this is what you have in visual cortex, which is a large primary visual cortex, which is a large uh, part of your brain. You have many, many of these detectors, each of which sees a small part of the world, and each of which responds to a small, um, to a particular orientation. So visual cortex sees the world as tiny little line segments more or less. And we also have a very clear organization of space because these cells um, that, with, uh, that have different receptive fields are organized in an orderly fashion on the cortex. So, um, for, so this is um, from an fMRI study in a human. Um, if you take a checkerboard pattern and you contract and expand it repeatedly, you find um, that um, central areas close to the center of vision are represented here towards the very back of the brain and as you move farther out in the periphery the activation travels forward like so and then you can take a wedge of, uh, of contrast and move it around at a constant um, eccentricity in the periphery and again you find an organization so the lower visual field will be higher up and then you go around until you come up here, up and to the right would be on the, uh, on the ventral bo bottom portion. So in other words, you have a map of the world on this large area at the back of the brain. And if you put a big letter A, let's say on the screen, you would see a letter A pattern of activity on the back of the brain in area V1. All right, so after the primary visual cortex, which is like so, this, all this visual information gets transmitted forward. Um, so this is a lateral view of the brain, right? This is the front, this is the back, this is the top here. And it turns out that all the visual field gets replicated many, many times. And so scientists, if you, if you um, investigate this tissue with an electrode, you find many visual areas, right? And each visual area has a complete representation of the visual field. Um, so these are some of the areas that we have identified so far. All right, so this is the, <coughs> sorry, the, the visual system. Um, there's an eye movement area sitting here, frontal in the brain, and here in between we have auditory and sensory um, and motor areas that we won't be talking about today. Okay, so um, what happens in these, um, in these areas? Well. In areas that are close to the primary visual cortex, um, they're organized in a, in a similar way. <clears throat> they, they follow the principle that we've seen in primary visual cortex. That is, the image is decomposed by detectors that are sensitive to different features. So I spoke about detectors that are sensitive to orientation. You also have detectors that are sensitive to motion. Um, they're sensitive to depth. Um, they're sensitive to color. And these detectors, um, they live in slightly different visual representations. So for example, if you have a complex object like a bee, um, different parts of your brain would see, would form different maps of the bee, pulling out the particular fe uh, feature that they're interested in, right? So one area may represent the motion of the bee and it's perhaps it's many segments. Um, another area might be sensitive to slightly longer con contours, like a curved or a straight line on the bee. Um, another area would be sensitive to the three-dimensional three um, 
features of it in another area to color, right? So the image is broken down um, into its constituent features. This is in early visual areas that are um, in, in primary visual cortex and areas that are close to it. So moving forward from there, um, we, the, uh, the visual information splits into um, sort of two large visual streams. One is a series of areas that lies sort of ventrally on the bottom of the, of the hemisphere. And, um, and another is a stream that goes dorsally towards the top of our head. And those uh, streams are relatively specialized for recognizing objects, or we, sometimes it's called the what stream on the ventral portion, and for analyzing space, for knowing where things are and generating movement in space. And as you move in forward in higher and higher areas, the neural responses that you find in these areas begin to resemble more um, our, uh, our perception, our exp uh, subjective experience of what things are. So, for, so, first of all, the neurons in these areas see large portions of the world. You, you no longer have this tiny view um, that, that we've seen in primary visual cortex. A neuron sees a, a larger part of the visual field. And second, the neurons seem selective to objects, not just to little lines or to dots or to uh, abstract color. They respond to particular objects. And here's an example from uh, an area uh, here, in inferior temporal cortex. Um, again, the activity of one neuron. So if you show to this cell a jumble of lines, uh, the cell does not, is not very impressed. It doesn't become very active. This jumble of lines would activate the primary visual cortex very well, but here it no longer drives the cells. On the other hand, this particular cell likes faces, right? So it, the, the more something looks like a face, the more it responds. And you find, so you find many uh, different cells that are selective for different faces, different facial features, and um, in adjacent parts of it, you have cells that are selective for specific objects. And a similar transformation happens here in the dorsal part, which is concerned more with space. Um, so um, two important things happen um, in the dorsal part. First of all, neurons no longer code where something is on your eye. And remember that where something is on your eye changes all the time because your eye moves all the time. What you are experiencing is where something is in space that is, your brain somehow ignores your eye movements or know that, knows that it should discount your eye movements. Right? You don't see the world moving, you see it is stable, and neurons in the parietal lobe respond to a particular location in space. So they have figured out uh, that things do not move in space. And um, in order to accomplish this feat, they receive information from uh, the eye, eye muscle proprioception, about where your eye is, where your eye will move next, also about your body and head movement. And they somehow figure, this, figure, uh, figure where things are um, in space. Also, we have um, some uh, more uh, three-dimensional representations. Um, so, so there's a lot more depth information. The neurons respond differently for something that is within reach or out of reach. Right? Sometimes it's not even a matter of uh, the absolute distance from the body. It's if something is, becomes out of reach for some reason, the neuron may stop responding to it. So you have a lot of integration in here with, what, uh, with, with your actions and your goals at that time. Um, and, um, and so, all right, and then finally here, this is, uh, again, I'm taking a large step, but um, we have to get to the frontal cortex. And um, frontal cortex is our, the, the seat of the, perhaps the higher order decisions. Um, we begin to, we categorize things, which is a prerequisite for action. Um, images are integrated with memory, with emotion, with values, and then um, all that is a prerequisite for deciding what to do. All right. 
So let's take a little um, look at the sequence of events, a very simplified look at the sequence of events that happens between the time when a photon moves your eye and the moment when you generate some uh, reaction to it. Okay, so you start, so here in this clock, imagine this whole clock, uh, 12 steps would be one second, all right? So we have responses arriving in the visual cortex um, in about um, 40 to 50 milliseconds, 0 0.04 of a second. And here we see line segments. And then the information begins to propagate. And it propagates very quickly. Um, so uh, we are here at about 50 or 60 milliseconds. We start to build start sl slightly larger contours and add some color. Um, then um, in about 100 milliseconds, um, we, we start to get responses to complex objects, things like faces and different places. And at about the same time, we start to build these more uh, complex spatial representations in the dorsal stream. Um, about 150 milliseconds, we start to see activity in the frontal lobe. Um, and by that time, you already have ascribed, you have categorized things. Um, and then at about the same time, we start seeing activity here, back in, the, in an area that we call the premotor cortex, which is a sort of precursor to movement. At about 200 milliseconds, we start seeing activity in the motor cortex, in this strip of cortex here that, uh, that drives movement. Um, this area has uh, direct, it has some indirect connections, but also direct connections with the spinal cord. Um, and by about 250 milliseconds, about a quarter of a second, uh, you can move your hand, if that's an appropriate thing to do, right? So this is a relatively simple thing where, where you don't need a lot of deliberation, you just see something, and you just see an apple and reach and grasp it. So this whole thing takes about a quarter of a second. All right, so um, before we uh, get too much ahead of ourselves and think that we figured everything out, I just have to want to remind you two things. So first of all, we have a lot of dark matter in the brain. These areas that I mentioned um, that, that we have studied and that we are basing this scheme on, um, in between them, there's a, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of areas that we don't know what they do, we haven't explored in detail. Um, and all the time, investigators are, are discovering new parts of the brain and, and figuring out functions for parts that we know are there, but we never knew what they did. And um, the other thing that I need to mention is that I gave you a very simplified feed-forward view, right, where information goes from vision to action. But in fact, all these areas are massively and recurrently interconnected with each other. So it's never the case that information travels only forward from the visual cortex to the muscle. The moment information reaches the next station with only maybe five millisecond delay, it also gets broadcast back. So all this circuit is massively interconnected. So this is why even in, um, in this uh, primary visual area, which you would, you, you would think would respond only to lights, only to small bars, in fact, we are starting to discover that it has um, higher order information about uh, the timing of an event, the expected timing of an event, or about the expected reward or outcome of something. You find it all the way back here, and that's because of feedback uh, that shapes. So, so what this means behaviorally is that your goals and actions shape the very earliest stages of perception. Again, perception is from beginning to end an active process. The only part of the brain that does not receive feedback is the retina. After the retina, everything is um, open game. All right. All right, so um, let's get to our topic today. So where is consciousness in all of this? Uh, well, I can't, we don't have a definitive answer, but we have some ideas. Um, so first of all, we know where consciousness is not. Um, it is not in the retina, it is not in primary visual cortex. We don't see little segments 
Um, uh, we don't see the world as segments. It's also not at very motor stages, right? So it's not in motor, in primary motor cortex, it's not in the spinal cord, it's not in the muscle. A lot of the details of how we execute our movements we are not aware of. You, you could never tell me how it is that you can stand up or how it is that you can move the 20 muscles that it take to move your finger. These are all unconscious processes. Mid-level areas, the ones that are, um, that are close to visual cortex, show some correlates of um, conscious perception, but not very much. And really where the action seems to be is in these intermediate areas, we call them association areas, temporal, the temporal lobe, um, the parietal cortex, and the frontal lobe. And, and those are the areas that are most closely related to your um, behavior, to your active behavior and decisions. Okay, so how do we know all this? Well, there, uh, there are various ways. Uh, one, um, one early, the earliest clue to awareness came uh, from the study of people with uh, damage due to uh, vascular lesions, for example, that's the most common. Um, and the first, maybe the earliest described syndrome was the syndrome of neglect. Um, which happens, so this is a, an example of vascular damage in the parietal area, in the dorsal, dorsal stream. Uh, this is in the right parietal cortex, it's inverted in this image. And um, these types of lesions also uh, often cause a profound loss of awareness of the space opposite the lesion. So usually it happens after a right parietal lesion and patients lose awareness of the left space. And this is truly a loss of awareness and not simply blindness. Um, um, the patients don't, don't see stimuli, um, whether visual or touch, um, on the um, left side of the body. They do not move, they're usually oriented towards, towards the right. Um, um, it, uh, sometimes they can um, ignore the left side, the left side of their body. So, um, you could have a patient say, what, what is this arm doing in the, next to me? It's, this is not my arm. This would be a very profound uh, neglect. And also, uh, when you ask patients to report their mental imagery, for example, recall, um, uh, recall a square from your childhood, they will tell you things that are on the right side of the square and not mention things that are on the left. Okay, so this is um, just a drawing made by a patient with neglect. Uh, this is a copy um, of, a, of a picture made by a, a normal subject. And then this is how um, the patient makes the same copy. And um, the most striking thing is that if you ask, when she's asked, is there anything missing in this picture, the answer is no. So this is really what distinguishes neglect from blindness. A person who is blind will say, I know I don't see something, and they will orient and try to see what's on the left. But after parietal or higher um, damage, um, just the knowledge or awareness of that part of the world is, is gone. Um, this is a, a self-portrait that you might get. Um, and um, the, the very interesting thing is that if you can do various tests in the laboratory, and you can ask, okay, the patient is not aware of this information that's on the left, but does that information influence behavior in any way? And the answer is yes. You can show that whatever was shown in this hemifield can um, influence unconsciously, subconsciously, what the patient does next. So there is a lot of processing going on, it's just that it is not conscious. All right, okay, I will, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Three more minutes? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so we can also pick up the correlates of this conscious awareness in uh, the activity of single neurons. So uh, one very neat way to do this is uh, what's called the binocular uh, rivalry paradigm, where people are shown um, two different images to each eye. Right? And this is not something that the brain is used to deal with, so usually we, we, 
we're used to see two different images, but they, they're close enough that we can fuse them and interpret them as a single object. But if you've shown two very different images, the brain doesn't know what to do with them. So what it does is it switches the percept. And sometimes it will, it will seem that you see one image, and then this could last for a few seconds, and then you switch, and you'll see the other image. Right? So your percept changes. And of course, you can, uh, in people, you can ask people to report when do you see the first, when do you see the second. You can also train animals to report when they see one or the other. And this is a neuron that's recorded from a high order area in the temporal lobe, um, one of these areas that we think would be related to awareness. And uh, the interesting thing here is that this, the physical image is precisely the same in these, uh, in these trials here and in these trials here. The visual stimulation is precisely the same for the cell. The only thing that changes is what uh, the subject is reporting. So here the subject is reporting the star. And this particular neuron is not activated by the star. It's just not its preferred shape. But here the subject is actually seeing the face and then the neuron starts responding. This is the preferred stimulus uh, for the cell. And here, uh, here it is again when uh, the subject reports the star. Um, there's no activity, I'm sorry, this is another cell, but it also doesn't like the star and it likes, um, it likes the face, a, fa a percept of a face. So um, in this, uh, this is a very simple view where we simply ask subjects, what do you see? What do you perceive? And uh, the neurons um, in these higher order areas um, go with the, um, with the percept, correlate very well with the percept. All right, how, so how does this happen? So this is um, a, a possible correlate of visual awareness. How does this happen? All right, we don't know, but we have a best guess. And in fact, this is a, a guess, an idea that's been around for a long time. Um, 1949, I think it was proposed by Donald Hebb. Is the idea of cell assemblies. So the idea is that you have this visual information and it activates many, many uh, cells throughout the brain. And um, again, one object is represented in many parts of the brain and you need to bind this activity together, right? In some way, the activation related to one object has to be bound together throughout the brain. So the idea is that neurons form these assemblies. So for example, so you could have these cells in red becoming activated together and you can show it like this. So you could have this network becoming active, and that corresponds to the percept of object A. And then your percept might switch, and this network, again, some of the same cells, but not precisely the same cells, this network would dominate and win um, the competition, and that would correspond to your percept of object B, and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so, so then if you look at a cell such as this, this cell is simply just, we're picking out just one little cell out of a larger distributed network. So the network corresponding to the face is now active, and again, throughout the brain, um, and then um, at, at other points in time, a slightly different network would become active. Now, um, okay, so just a couple of things about this. Um, you need, so in order, a, a very important uh, point about this, sustain, this activation is that it cannot be transient. It needs to be sustained to some extent, right? So you can see, sorry, um, this activity here, right? This cell, in order for something to become conscious, you, it's not enough to just have a transient burst of activity. You need to, to keep it in there because you, for, for a sufficient period of time in order to commit it to memory, in order for you to, in order to link it with the response, in order for you to say, ah, oh, okay, I see object A or I see object B. So this sustained activity, this is uh, what we call short-term memory. Um, this sustained activity, it can be generated um, fairly simply in a neural network by recurrent excitations. So you can have a cell that receives a visual input excite itself, right? And you can imagine this happening over the larger network of, of cell, of the larger cell assembly. These cells, um, so they excite themselves so that memory remains there for, uh, for a brief period of time. 
But the problem is that in order to have this sustained activity, you also have to have a lot of inhibition. Because otherwise, this is a positive feedback circuit. If everything excites itself, you can see how things can go out of control very quickly. So the only way to generate sustained activity is to inhibit the rest of the brain. And we know that in frontal parts of the brain, in fact, the inhibitory activity can be quite strong. So this could be, and this is speculative, this could be uh, a reason for the limited capacity of our consciousness. In other words, it's only one of these assemblies that can stay there at a given time and you don't, simply don't have room for being conscious of, of, of other things. Of other we need to wrap it up. All right, so uh, that's it. I'm, I'm wrapping it up. That's it? All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, now after the customary 30 seconds that optimistically is going to take to switch computers. Okay, um, I'm supposed to uh, represent the, uh, the philosophical side of things, um, but I actually don't believe there are really two different um, you know, takes. I think that um, um, the way I see this area, there is a single subject matter that's studied in somewhat different ways by philosophers of mind and by psychologists and neuroscientists. So, um, now I should also say, and as will become apparent, that Professor Gottlieb and I completely disagree about the nature of consciousness in the brain. Um, from my point of view, what she just told you about was what I would describe as reported consciousness. That is, the conscious experiences wrapped up together with the way we think about them and give voice to them. So I take a, um, a more restricted, restricted view, and I think that a lot that um, uh, the, uh, the basis of consciousness is actually more narrowly circumscribed in the brain. And I'll say a little bit uh, about uh, uh, why I think this. Um, but it should make for an interesting discussion. So the, I'm going to talk about a, um, uh, a way in which we can tell about what consciousness is in the brain by looking at a particular phenomenon in which it breaks down. Um, and I'm going to focus on the issue of whether consciousness is rich or sparse, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So I'm going to say a little bit about something called change blindness and its relation to attention first. Okay, so change blindness. Uh, this is uh, discovered in the 60s, in the 1960s, but the stuff I'm going to tell you about really be only became to be understood in the 19, late 1990s. And uh, a paradigm that's quite useful is you see a picture, you see a gray area, you see another picture that differs in some way from the first picture, another gray area, and then it loops. And these people were the uh, discoverers of the following really interesting fact, which is that Despite the impression we have that we see, every, we see the whole picture, we're very bad at telling what the differences are, and I'm going to give you some examples. So, um, you're going to get uh, examples of this very, oops, sorry, I'm trying to give an example. <laughs> okay, there it goes. So don't shout out what's changing if you see it. But how many do see what's changing? Maybe I should ask, how many don't see what's changing? OK, so I'm going to tell you what's changing, and I'll show you one or two more. What's changing is this. One picture has more leaves than the other. OK, here's another one. Okay, you could, and some of these people can look at them 50 times and not see what's changing, but I'll tell you what it is in this case, it's the horizon. Okay, this is an easier one, it's this thing. 
Okay, so what's the point of this? Um, so first of all, look, I hope you, you realize it's a surprising phenomenon. And what typically happens when there's a surprising phenomenon, it means something we think is wrong. And we're going to have to decide what that is. And that gives rise to a major dispute in this area, of which the disagreement between me and, and, and uh, uh, Professor Gottlieb is an example. So first of all, the first thing to realize, and this everybody accepts this, is that the explanation of the phenomenon has to do with attention. Now, this is a, an example of one of these stimuli. Uh, unfortunately, this one doesn't work with a Mac, so I couldn't show you this one. But um, so in this one, you see one picture with this bar here, and then another picture with a bar up there. And people typically don't see it. And that is related to the fact that they, they're, if you look at a picture, typically there will be some things for each person will attend to certain things, but not others. This is an eye tracking trace, which gives you an, a, a little bit of a sense, not a perfect sense, of where the viewer is attending. And you see only one hit on that bar, and you can uh, um, uh, continue on with the eye track for this subject, and there's still only one hit on the bar. And so the bar is a very good thing to, to, to change if you want to make one of these things that people, where people don't see the change. And you could easily make these things yourself, and you can easily do it just with two pictures. You look at one, put it down, look at the other one, and you won't see what, what's different if the person who made it has chosen something that you regard as background. So we know the explanation is attentional, but that leaves us with two possibilities, what's been called inattentional blindness and inattentional inaccessibility. So what do those come to? Um, and I'll now talk about sparse versus rich. So inattentional blindness is you don't see the features that are changing. Inattentional inaccessibility is you do see the features that change, but you don't conceptualize them at a level that would allow you to make a proper comparison. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, so the idea that you don't see the features that change goes with the thesis of sparse phenomenology. The visual world around you doesn't really have as many experienced things in it as people think. Um, the inattentional and accessibility view says, oh, sorry, this sparse phenomenology, phenomenology is the content of consciousness. That is, the content of consciousness is sparser than people think. Um, the rich phenomenology view, which I um, hold, um, says that uh, we, there are many things in our conscious visual field, but we, we, we have trouble comparing um, one to another. Um, the sparse phenomenology view goes with something that is sometimes called the refrigerator light illusion. The idea is just as someone might think that the refrigerator light is always on because it's on when you look, the idea is so we think we have a rich visual field, conscious visual field, because wherever we attend, we see something. The question is, was it there before we attended? So I think yes, but my sparse phenomenology opponents think no. Um, but I think, um, um, uh, so the problem I have is I believe in a kind of limitation on, in our knowledge of our own experience, which is itself very um, contrary to common sense. So I think there isn't any way to avoid giving up some aspect of, cog of, of common sense here. Um, now sometimes these ideas are called representation failure, that is the unintentional blindness. Um, uh, it, it, a person holds that we don't represent as much as uh, it seems we do. And uh, the view I hold is sometimes called a comparison failure. We do represent it, but we, we have trouble making the comparisons. Um, so let's see what we have over here. Um, OK, I, I guess what I will do is um, I'll mention one phenomenon, one other phenomenon that I think just intuitively supports the, um, um, the comparison failure view. Um, so now this is what's an example of what's known as a slow change in a change blindness experiment. 
So I'm going to press the go button, and something's going to change, but slowly. And your job is to look and see if you can see what it is. OK, one, two, three, go. It's working. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say. Keep it to yourself. OK, I think it's about done. And now I'm going to move the slider back so you can see what it used to look like. That's what it used to look like. That's what it looked like at the end. OK, so my view is that this supports rich phenomenology because I think it's just obvious that you saw the base. Look how big, how big a part of the picture it, it takes up. So you must have seen it. You just didn't make the comparison. You didn't code it up as red to begin with, and then code it up as blue at the end and compare it. So that's, and then I think that's the, uh, uh, the nature and generally of, of the phenomenon. It's the comparison failure, according to me, that's the problem. Now I'm going to make a little tiny detour into something, this may seem like changing this, the topic, but you'll see why I'm doing this. So I'm going to talk just a second about working memory, which uh, Professor Gottlieb also uh, mentioned. Now, there are a ton of experiments that suggest that in, throughout the animal kingdom, we have a very limited ability to hold things in our memory temporarily. In, sometimes it's called working memory. And here you have a, um, an experiment on uh, rhesus macaques. This is uh, in an island um, off the uh, east coast of Puerto Rico, where there's a rhesus macaque colony. And um, so here's how this experiment works works. You have an experimenter, and he brings two buckets. He finds a monkey that's not doing anything. Um, well, if, they are, if they're busy in something, they're not going to pay any attention. Uh, so he finds a monkey that's not doing anything. They're quite curious. And they quickly cotton onto the fact that the guy's got a pocket full of apple pieces. So he puts, say, one, two apple pieces in one bucket, say, one, two, three apple pieces in the other bucket. And then he pulls back and waits to see where the monkey goes. Answer, monkey goes almost every time to the one with three instead of the one with two. So the monkey chooses three versus two, also two versus one, four versus three. Now the interesting thing is what happens when you get over four? You might think that if you did eight versus three, the monkey would be thinking, OK, that one's got a lot, and this one's got just three. I'll go get the lo a lot. But actually, that's not what happens. What happens is the monkey's at chance. And the reason is, to put, put it in terms of, of one particular view of this, which not everybody completely accepts, but everybody accepts that it's at least true approximately, there are four slots in working memory. If you overflow the four slots, then the system just goes kaplooey. It doesn't know what to do. Some of you may have heard of a famous paper by George Miller from a long time ago called The Magic Number 7, plus or minus 2. So he tried to explain why we have phone numbers at that time. We had phone numbers that had seven digits that people could process. Turns out he didn't control for chunking, where you associate, two, you associate a, a things together in a single chunk, and which we can do, and which working memory does, and explains why you can have two chunks, one for this bucket and one for this bucket. Um, so he thought the, 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 the limit of working memory was, was seven, but actually for adult monkeys and humans, it's roughly about four if you control for chunking. Um, so just to re re remind you, that comparison is the key one. Now this also works with human babies. They have a, you can put three pieces of, of graham cracker in one bucket, in one box, and two in another, and they'll go to the one with the more. And there are other alternative ways of testing the same thing, like, well, I won't describe them unless somebody wants to know. Um, and amazingly, the same 
um, 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 a kind of limit applies uh, in many other animal species that have been tested. One dramatic recent example is in bees, believe it or not. Um, okay, so now I'm going to now we get back to consciousness, and I'm going to contrast working memory with what is sometimes called phenomenal or iconic memory. And I'm going to show you a psychology experiment done in the University of Amsterdam by Victor Lamé and his, uh, um, in his lab, which has been the subject of um, a more and more and more elaboration. I'm going to show you the original experiment. OK, so the way this experiment works is the subject sees you're supposed to fixate at the center. So first you see this, then you see this, then you see this. But you're supposed to fixate your eyes at the center, and you'll, the, the subject sees a, 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 a circle of um, rectangles, and there's a, there's a blank, and then there's another circle, and there's a pointer pointing to one. And your task as the subject is to say whether this square is this, or this rectangle is the same orientation as the original one in that place. And here the answer is no, because it was vertical and now it's horizontal. Okay, everybody get the idea? All right, so you do, you do, if you do it like this, the subjects show the change blindness. They, they think they see all or almost all of these, but they can only get about four right. However, if you do it at the beginning, they can get them all, not surprisingly. The key thing is what about the middle? Now, it's been known um, since the mid-19th century, at least, that presented with uh, a bunch of things like this briefly, this is on for a second, um, people often feel they have a kind of mental image of it even after the thing goes, after the stimulus goes off. And subjects in this experiment who were especially prepared by practicing and relaxing were able in one of the experiments to make this image last as long as four seconds. So the key question is what happens when the pointer is in the middle? The answer is they do almost as well as when, it was, as when it's here. Almost as almost all eight. And here's a little diagram of it. And the idea of my argument is that the way they do at the end when it's here represents working memory um, or the capacity of cognitive access. Whereas the way they do when it's in the middle represents the capacity of visual phenomenology which seems to be at least 15 items as compared with the four, roughly four items there. So the idea is we can, ex we can figure out what visual phenomenology is in the brain by comparing the capacity of conscious phenomenology system with the capacity of the cognitive access system. And we see that the capacity of the conscious phenomenology system is higher. And that allows us to narrow, to home in on what is the real basis of that phenomenology. Now, the place where uh, Professor Gottlieb and I disagree is the, is the role of frontal areas in the brain, which I think are mainly um, a feature of the cognitive access system. And one indication of this is that a recent experiment, which I actually just read this morning by the same lab in the, in, in the University of Amsterdam, used a technique uh, called um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which, is, uh, which involves putting a coil on the head and creating temporary brain damage. And what they were able to do is create temporary br brain damage in the front of the head, the seat of working memory, specifically the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex which had an impact on the working memory, but not on the capacity of, uh, of, of that system. So um, another piece of evidence, and, and I, I, there are, I think, quite a lot of evidence, that the system that is really supporting the phenomenology as opposed to our cognitive access to the phenomenology is largely in the back of the head in the visual areas. Um, so, but now let me consider an objection. Why should mental images be so important? And the reason is that in this kind of experiment I'm talking about, the high capacity um, 
can be seen to be in brain areas that are neural bases, and are they're part of the neural base of the phenomenology, and certainly not in retina or very early vision. And here's a nice experiment that suggests this. In, okay, I'll finish up. In which they found the, um, uh, uh, Professor Gottlieb mentioned seeing a picture of the A upside down in the back of the head. Well, in later visual areas, you can see these pictures too, and they could find pictures for those persisting images in V4, but not V3, V2, or V1. Um, again, suggesting that those long-lasting images are not due to capacity of the retina or early vision. So you may ask, what does this result have to do with consciousness? Can it be explained in terms of information processing without um, reference to consciousness? Well, of course, if you're interested in consciousness, you're going to want to know what the re relevance is to consciousness. Um, and the, the key facts here are that subjects say they're reading their response off a persisting visual image. Uh, they can do size as well as orientation. And the areas that, um, 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 that uh, are active are good candidates for inclusion in this neural basis of consciousness, V4 rather than the earlier areas. So just to, um, let's see, I'll try to wind this up. Um, let, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to present a little picture here which kind of illustrates the um, um, disagreement. So this is, uh, these come from um, um, uh, uh, some series of articles by Stanislaus Dehaan, who has the same view as, uh, as uh, Professor Gottlieb. Um, and he and I have been, been disagreeing in, in public f uh, about this issue for some time. Um, so here is a little diagram of his that illustrates what's agreed on and what isn't. Um, all right, so these are brains. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. These arrows represent attention. Arrow pointing away from the visual cortex means attention away from the visual stimulus. Arrow pointing towards the back of the brain means attention to the visual stimulus. So first of all, you can have an unattended, very weak stimulus that isn't perceived at all. Then you can have an attended weak stimulus, which is subliminal perception. Everybody agrees unconscious subliminal perception. And then another case, which everybody agrees on, is the case where you're attending to the stimulus and you have these recurrent loops uh, uniting the back of the head with the front of the head. And Professor Gottlieb talked about that in some detail. So these recurrent view loops involving the whole brain, and those are the, the clearly conscious cases. The disputed cases are cases that have now been produced in a few labs and ascertained to fit this description, as Don and I both agree. Cases where you have very active, recurrent loops in the back of the head, attention is disengaged, which explains why they're not getting to the mechanisms of access. So Dehan calls this the pre-conscious. Um, whereas I think there's a strong case to be made that these are actually conscious experiences that you have trouble reporting. And part of the basis is something that I've just shown you here, which is that you need these loops to explain the high capacity. You can have many different neural coalitions going on at once, whereas once you get into the front of the head, you can only have a few, up to maybe four. Um, so in order to explain that high phenomenal capacity, you need to appeal to phenomenology back here. Now, there is an interesting possibility. Uh, Professor Gottlieb mentioned um, the binocular rivalry paradigm, uh, which um, uh, pinpoints um, a, a locus of face perception in the bottom of the temporal lobe, something called the fusiform face area. You know, you get the subject, you, you, you're in this paradigm where you see, uh, you're showing a face in one eye and a, that, that pattern in the other eye. You see a face, a pattern, a face, a pattern. Well, the area that really goes on and off with seeing the face is in this area in the bottom of the temporal lobe, the fusiform, fusiform face area. However, she also mentioned the neglect syndrome in which people don't report on the left side of space. Okay, there's a variant of that where subjects can report on the left side of face, space, but not if there's a stimulus on the right and the left. If there's one on the right and the left, they can't report on the left. It's usually the left rather than the right for reasons we need not go into. However,
However, one of these subjects in a study by Garen Rees was shown to have an active fusiform face area even though he said he didn't see the thing on the left. Um, so the possibility arises, and this hasn't been tested as far as I know in terms of looking for these recurrent loops, whether this guy might actually have face experience that he doesn't know about. So I'll, I'll wind up uh, quickly. I just want to say one thing. It is common to object to this point of view by um, saying that, well, look, you just have to believe what people tell you about their conscious experience. Otherwise, how are you ever going to find anything out? You know, you might as well say that the, that the, the, you, know, the, uh, the you know, rocks or the stage is conscious. If you don't believe what people tell you, you're screwed. Um, actually not. Um, and I'll just give you one example. This is a patient, uh, there are many, there's a syndrome called anisognosia where people report falsely about their experience and things to do with their body because of a certain cognitive deficit. So, um, here's a patient, I, I, you know, I, I'll just show you a brief um, take from this because um, it's kind of interesting to see. So this is a guy who's paralyzed on his left side and uh, this is, it's an Italian and, and uh, um, uh, you can see the, the um, so one thing you may notice about this patient is he, he's bored, he's yawning, he's very depressed. Every tape I've seen of one of these patients who are unaware of their deficit has been extremely, they're, they're depressed. Um, so now she's asking him about, this is a tape of Anna Berti, an Italian uh, neuropsychologist, um, and she's asking him, would you be able to move your left arm? He says, yes, surely. Um, please try to move it. Yes, he says, but he's not trying. Please try to reach my hand with your left arm. Now he's going to try. He's trying to move his left arm. And she says, have you done it? And he says, yes. Um, now, um, a common, um, um, one explanation of some of these is that they may be hallucinating, but others seem to be confabulating, and there's a lot of evidence of this, and I'm not going to really have time to um, go into it. But uh, I think I'll just tell you that um, many of these pay, what? You're 26. I have what? 26 minutes already. Oh, okay. I'll, be, I'll, I'll wind up. Um, okay, I don't have time to go into it. But many of these patients show the, the um, uh, very typical signs of people who are really aware of something but are trying to keep, them, keep themselves from recognizing it. And anyway, the, the upshot of this is this. You can't just believe people about their experience. There are a lot of neuropsychological syndromes where you don't know whether what somebody is saying about their experience is right or not. The guy may be experiencing paralysis, but, none, but saying he's not. Um, and so there really is no alternative to the following method, um, which I will... Um, um, which is the method that um, uh, uh, C.S. Peirce uh, uh, said, uh, described as abduction, but in uh, contemporary philosophy is more often described as inference to the best explanation. What you have to do is put, in, you, 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 uh, you start off um, um, initially believing what people say, unless you have some reason to deny it. But the main thing is you have to form the best theory you can based on all the evidence you can find. Um, and I, I believe that if you do that, you'll find that um, uh, we have reason to think that there are um, um, experiences that f to which we have, have limited accessibility. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, you've heard it. Um, now, in a minute or two, we're going to be starting to take questions from the floor. Um, I've had a lot of things actually to ask both of you, but of course I will restrain myself because we're already at 4.30 almost. Uh, I'm going to start with you only one or two questions perhaps, which is um, Scientific American uh, at the beginning of the last decade declared the 2000s the decade of the brain. Um, 
um, seems like going to 2011. And um, I get the impression from you guys thinking that, that we are in fact getting closer to understanding the physical basis of consciousness. But do we need a century of the brain, a millennium of the brain, uh, or what? Both of you. Okay, millennium. <laughs> You're an optimist, aren't you? Okay. Uh, wh why, why do you think so? Um, because we are very far from knowing everything. There is that dark matter, first of all. Um, It's just an enormous number of unanswered questions. Um, so um, the, the neurons that I showed, so the, in the human brain, we have a particularly uh, big problem. The, the neurons that I've shown you mostly come from recordings in experimental animals. Um, experimental animals are trained to report what they see. They, so they usually work for physical rewards, right? You train, you know, you can train a rat to press a lever if he sees a light uh, going on. Um, but the, the, so, um, and, and, you can, and you can sort of convince yourself that the rat presses the lever, you know, if there's a light and doesn't press the lever, if there is no light, so maybe the rat really reports what it's experiencing, right? But you have to remember that what the rat wants is to get uh, the food or to get the reward. And so you can make that rat report all kinds of things um, by just manipulating the reward, right? So in, in particular, so in, in people, we, can, we have a bit more confidence that they can, um, they actually report what they see and we really need that report in order to infer whatever, is go whatever correlates with it without, without that report of one inner percept we cannot get anywhere, I think that's where the disagreement is. Um, so anyway, so in people we have some confidence that whatever you tell me is indeed what you, what you experience. Uh, with animals, uh, you know, we have some confidence, but I think it's less because we, so we have even less access to the animal's conscious experience. So nevertheless, the most detailed biological information that we can obtain is from animals. If we uh, look in the, if we try to understand the brains of people, we're of course much more limited and we can only work from the outside. We can use um, sort of uh, primitive methods such as transcranial magnetic stimulation which um, induces a very non-physiological state that depresses activity in one part of the brain but also globally in many brain areas. So that's a very blunt tool. Uh, we can record um, functional imaging, which is, I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, which is the best, maybe per perhaps the most exciting way we have to look inside the brains uh, of humans. But uh, functional imaging measures a parameter of blood flow. It measures the oxygenation level in the blood. How, th how that relates to the actual activity of neurons that actually convey your subjective experience. It's an enormously complex question that we still don't understand. So whenever you see these beautiful images um, of you know, your, um, the face area or the place area lighting up in the brain, uh, when you do something, it's only blood flow, it's oxygenation level in the blood, it, it is the local activity of, may, it maybe has a complex relationship with the local activity of thousands of neurons. They could be excitatory, they could be inhibitory neurons, and these neurons could be doing all kinds of different things. So again, functional imaging is a very blunt tool. So we all like to spin these stories, and of course we all, uh, and that's what that drives progress, we, even on the limited information that we have, we always like to make inferences and move forward, and we move forward in little steps and figure out what we can, but we have to realize that we are really, really far away from actually understanding the brain. Now, I don't think this is pessimistic. I mean, I actually enjoy the act of discovery, and if we figured everything out, you know, it would be, things would be boring, and 
Um, right. can all you, go you just home, asked so. for thousands of years of funding. So Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to convey. Uh, I, I want to hear Ned's opinion on, on, this, on the status of you know, how far are we from, from sort of, in other words, the same question. But, but um, going back to what you just said about the functional imaging. So one of the things that, that um, uh, don't seem to be clear to a lot of people is that actually looking at those images gives you a snapshot, it's not a real time, uh, it's a statistical reconstruction over several subjects, right? It's not that you're actually literally looking at somebody's brain, an individual brain, in real time, correct? Right, absolutely. Right. Which makes it more complicated to, to figure out what's going on. Ned, what, what do you think? A thousand years? A hundred years? Tomorrow? You know, I don't really have any educated answer to that. Why don't we get questions from the audience? <laughs> um, sure, that's a way to scare them a question, if I've, if I've ever heard one. Um, okay, um, after that, First question, whoever wants to line up. Thank you very much. Some of you are aware of the gorilla on the basketball court experiment that they've done, yes, where they've had people playing basketball in a circle, passing the ball. A gorilla passes and actually into the, into the viewing area and leaves, and most about 85% of the people that view it never see the gorilla, the man in the gorilla suit that's actually walking across the basketball court. So it seems to me that consciousness is what we're capable of actually being conscious of. And it seems that there is no definition of consciousness because none of us actually are capable of being conscious of everything. Now, how would you respond to that? What do you think? Or do you want to skip this? No. <laughs> um, okay, so the two views, sparse versus rich, that I mentioned disagree about the gorilla case. Um, I should say, first of all, it's not 85%, maybe 50%. Um, but, um, so the, the rich view is, uh, which I hold, um, uh, for, says for cases like that, um, it may well be that what, what's going on is you see a shape that you don't categorize as a gorilla. Um, I actually, if I'd had time, I have a few of these little movies that uh, shows stuff like that. But many people uh, um, will say it, uh, afterwards that, well, maybe I did see some kind of black, sh uh, some kind of black shape, but I was concentrating on the white-shirted people. Okay, that, on that side then. So uh, there are re um, some relatively recent studies, such as uh, those by Dr. Berlin up at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, that show that um, subliminal recognition on the order of 17 and 50 uh, milliseconds affects subsequent behavioral decisions in controlled laboratory experiments without registering any type of uh, conscious visual impact of the stimulus. So I was wondering uh, if you could comment on that in relation to your view on the role of being aware of a visual stimulus in whatever consciousness might be in your view. Uh, the second has to do with, um, and th this is kind of for both of you, but I wanted to hear two answers, uh, in that um, focusing on visual phenomena alone seems to be at a level that doesn't require human consciousness not just because of uh, older brain regions, such as the basal ganglia, reticular activating formation, limbic system, and so on, involved in uh, non-cortical recognition and motor response, but the fact that uh, consciousness seems to emerge from a gestalt of all sensor, sensory modalities uh, that m may have more to do with chaotic boundaries and the Santa Fe Institute's type of uh, mathematics of emergence. So, and that's more of a professor block, block to come on, if he decides to. Jacqueline. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll return to the first question. So yes, there's, um, there's um, a lot of evidence for subliminal perception. Um, as I, I mentioned before, um, um, the studies in, in neglect patients, right? Patients who are absolutely unaware of seeing anything in their uh, neglected visual field, um, if you show them a picture of a burning house in that field, they will avoid that field even more, right? You can see them turn even more to the right. So there's, thing, and there's, there's processing going on, and it goes on to very high levels. So there's evidence that people categorize things, that they extract their semantic meaning. So if you show you know, a subliminal picture of a cat, 
uh, you see that uh, uh, people are more likely to report things as falling into the animal category, so it, it goes to a very high level. So um, then I think, you know, the, the whole debate is whether or not you call that consciousness. It's high level processing indeed. Do you call it conscious uh, or not? And um, my view um, um, as an empiricist, and, and that's a bit of a matter of definition, um, as an empiricist, I have no way of knowing whether someone is conscious of, some, of anything unless that person reports it to me in some way, right? So, um, so I would define that as unconscious, subconscious. Hold on, um, Matt, any comment? Um, yeah, so what I would say is that the first level of data we have, the most important data is what people say, but that data can lead to a picture in which people can have conscious experience that they can't report. In fact, that was the, the line of argument that I was giving, which, was, which is that we can use data about, given what people say, to construct a picture of rich visual consciousness in the back of the head um, that exceeds our capacity to report. <laughs> yes. Hi. I have a question for uh, Professor Block. Um, so, I'm not sure if I understand your definition of consciousness. It seems to be stating that awareness is not a prerequisite. I'm not sure if that's what you mean by cognitive access. But um, it seems as though the two of you are kind of talking that the process of visual perception occurs in the same way, but you're, the debate is where the line is drawn between conscious and pre-conscious. But um, I'm not really certain uh, what you mean when you say that there can be a consciousness of a visual stimulus that is impossible to report on or to produce a declarative statement about. How, is, how does that differ for, from some sort of subconscious awareness? Um, okay, so the first question about awareness. So, you know, of course the terms here, so everybody uses them in, in their own way. But uh, one common view in philosophy that stems from Aristotle is that, um, to put it in contemporary ter terms, that a conscious state can partly consists in an awareness of itself. It has a self. It has a kind of looping, self-reflexive nature. And at least if you understand it that way, I think that consciousness does involve awareness. Um, but I also think that we have more consciousness than we can report, and we may even, in some un unusual cases like. Uh, the, the brain damage patients I mentioned, we might have conscious states that the subject cannot report. And they would involve awareness, but no, no possibility of report. Um, l like the, um, uh, the anosognosic patient that I mentioned, and there was another syndrome I didn't get a chance to get to, which I think might also be an example. Exactly. What, what would you say is the, the, the relationship between awareness and consciousness? Um, well, I... I, I would agree with the speaker. I, I would, um, um, I, they're the same, I would think that they're the same thing. Um, I, again, the, it is a matter of definition, so I, uh, I do agree with the, with the person who asked the question. We, we actually, um, I think we, we describe the steps in visual perception the same way, um, me and Professor Block, and the question is whether uh, certain kinds of activations, uh, strong activations in sort of relatively higher visual areas uh, that are not reported, are those conscious or not? That's the, that's the crux. And, and um, um, I just don't, um, it, it seems to me um, difficult to, it, it seems to me even a dangerous step uh, the dangerous direction to go in, to say, well, we can read your brain and we tell you that you are really conscious of this stimulus because we see some sort of blood flow signal in your brain. Now, remember, we don't really understand what that blood flow signal is, which is just the best measure we have today. But, well, I see a little bit more blood oxygenation in that part of the brain. That means you really were conscious of seeing that stimulus. So it doesn't really matter what you tell me. I define your consciousness based on some blood flow measure that I don't even really understand. 
So, you know, it seems to me a dangerous direction to go in, right? So you could say, um, you know, um, th there's a similar debate going on in the field of neuroeconomics about internal value that we ascribe to things. So um, economists are holding fast to this idea of revealed preference, right? If I, I let you choose between apples and pears, and your pattern of choices tells me what you like. And that's all that I need. Whatever you tell me that you like, that is what you like. But now we're in the area of functional imaging and we can look inside the brain and we think we know, ah, this particular blood oxygenation level means that you like apples more and this level means that you like pears more. And let's say you have a subject who comes into the room and he tells you by his choices that he likes apples more. But then you look in the brain and, and you say, well, you know, your value signal in the brain actually tells me you like pears more. So I think you like pears more. Um, you can see how that can be a very dangerous direction to go into, to, to go to. I, I wouldn't even want to go there. First of all, I don't think it's scientifically justified. And second, I think it's very dangerous. And so I would very strongly advocate that conscious is a private experience. The only person who can report on that uh, is you, the subject, because by definition it is a subjective experience. If you don't experience it, it just doesn't exist. So I would draw, I would put the definition differently. If I see activation uh, that you're not reporting, and I can reasonably believe that in your report, um, then I would just call that unconscious. If it's not conscious to you, then it's just unconscious. Right. I, that, I would stop there. The <laughs> last clarification, of, of course, takes out the possibility when the subject is actually lying, right? Well, well that's, that's a problem. Right. That, yeah. that, is a pro that is always a problem, and then, yeah, so. When the mo so these, if, you, if you want to hide your consciousness, again, it's a private experience. Right. You can hide it. I mean, one of the major, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, look, before you say we can never tell if somebody's conscious if they don't say they're conscious, think about those brain damage cases. So we have a lot of, I, of course I agree that um, you, know, you don't want to conclude from some scan that you don't really understand that the person is really conscious even though he says he's not. But let me just tell you a little bit about these patients. First of all, the syndrome I described is only present in an acute phase that lasts a couple of months. Afterwards, they recover. They often, when they recover, they say, you know, when I was going, when I look back at what I was telling you before, I was wrong. I really was aware of my paralysis. Second, when they are denying their paralysis, they show a lot of signs that they really know about it. They perform on various tests as if they really know about it. Um, so there are behavioral tests that clue you in to something. And once you realize that it can happen in a brain damaged patient, you really have no intellectually responsible choice other than to realize maybe it can happen in a normal person too. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm an architect and I deal with what is seen and perceived. Um, do you have any opinions on uh, or implications of lesson learned from your research or your opinions on, uh, for the design of space or um, what kind of uh, implications there are for design in general of the visual? And if not, uh, what kind of implications uh, does our knowledge of how we perceive things, uh, what kind of implications are there for that? Anybody want to, once again, to function on design of things? Based on perception? I mean, I know you can build things in a way that really disorients people and, and make them fall down. <laughs> the Why would you want to do that? <laughs> There's some Japanese architects that love doing that. Right. Um, <laughs> you, you have a privilege to pass. <laughs> you They're passing, my friend. Um, I'm sorry, I have, I mean, one thing I can think of. Um, uh, um, uh, beware of spaces that are too open. That's what I would tell you as an architect. And I think that, but, but I think that, you know, <laughs> many of these things, I mean, most of us, no matter what we do, we are dealing with the mind. We are subject, we are, we are stud students of the mind. So you as an architect probably know more about people's reactions to space than I know in the lab. 
right? I cannot, um, um, if I'm not studying that topic, um, I, I guess I'm not an expert. Maybe some people do study the um, space perception in this. Um, I can try to look up some studies. But anyway, so I, I can't tell you very much. So I think that your intuitions, um, based on what you observe, are probably better than mine. Um, but one thing that I can tell you is that um, very open spaces are anxiety provoking. And we see that in animals. And I think that people have the same reaction. So I know that there's, you know, we all want open space, especially living in New York. We want these big buildings and many um, universities. I think the MIT uh, Neurosciences Building had this, um, this experience at MIT where, where they build this a uh, very big building, a lot of glass, a lot of open spaces, a lot of um, open spaces for people to meet with little chairs in like big open rooms and nobody goes there because you just feel very uncomfortable. So um, just keep that in mind. I mean, you need, you need size, but not too much. You just made me feel much better about my apartment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have time for probably a couple more questions. So yes, go ahead. Uh, for some recent period, in the philosophical literature on philosophy of mind has referred to experimental research showing that uh, the, the impulse to, um, to, to move a, a hand or, or ra raise an arm and the choice of which arm, et cetera, um, can, can be measured prior to the impulse um, associated with uh, the thought of doing so. You're talking about the limited experiments. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, what what are those experiments really measuring, and and do, uh, do we necessarily conclude conclude from that that uh, that, that this uh, appearance of, of um, uh, top down direction or or uh, cognitive control of, of motion is is merely an, an epiphenomenon of the uh, yeah. of the process. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm really curious. So is consciousness just an, an illusion mm -hmm. um, that we create, or is it more than that? Uh -huh. Well, I think that <clears throat> it goes back to, um, maybe a little bit to the, the blind side versus conscious report. So, so we can certainly do things um, very quickly, and we can, um, you know, before we are aware that we even want to do them. So I think because there, there are multiple pathways, right? So you have, you have sensory motor pathways. Um, there's one that I told you that takes about um, a quarter of a second, but there are more rapid, um, even more rapid pathways. So you can certainly engage this whole loop relatively quickly. And, but to be, to be able to say, I am planning to do this, takes a little more time because you have to sustain, to, to, you have to set up another set of, um, of brain activity, maybe a recurrent activity in some larger network, and that's where the discrepancy can be. So you can, you can move and even intentionally move and, um, and only later be able to say, oh yeah, now I actually want to move. Now, the, to con you cannot really conclude, even if this happens, even if you become aware of your intentions a bit later, you can't really conclude that your movement was not top-down controlled or cognitively controlled. Because you can have plans, you can have planned to make that movement ahead of time. And remember this, we have feedback all the time and our goals and our expectations influence everything, even very early stages of processing. So it's very possible that you, I can put you in a situation where you are planning to move, you are planning to reach to something, in that sense you have control. So when you get the trigger, you, you move, and then it takes you a little, a little longer to say, yes, I meant to, I have the intention to do it, right? It doesn't mean that your movement was not top-down controlled. So again, top-down control and consciousness are not, or awareness um, are not exactly the same thing. Matt? Well, okay, so you're not aware of the most paradoxical result along these lines, apparently, um, which is a, a result in the Libet paradigm by Hakwan Lao, where he showed that um, part of the, the neural basis of uh, the conscious intention to push the button occurs actually after the button is pushed. 
which is a really cool result. But look, I don't, I think it, that um, thinking about this does sort of, you know, make you feel a little bit like this, but I don't, it, uh, here's the way I would recommend thinking about it. All conscious events, I, I think, are brain events. Brain events simply take time. There's always going to be an unconscious part of any brain event that occurs before the conscious part occurs. Consciousness doesn't occur uh, immediately. It, it doesn't occur in an instant. It's a process that builds up. So I th think we should think of our intentions as like icebergs with um, a conscious part and an unconscious part. And it's no surprise that the unconscious part starts well before the conscious part. And it's a little more puzzling that maybe the conscious part appears partly after we actually do it. Um, but um, it's just what you'd expect if conscious states are uh, if if conscious states are brain states. I am very conscious that in, that we have time for only one more question because I'm aware of the time. So Matt, last one. Thank you very much. Um, this is sparked by Professor Block's presentation, but I also welcome uh, Professor Gottlieb's responses. Um, two questions. One is. The two uh, experiments you mentioned, one involving the, um, the paralyzed person who didn't realize or who was confabulating, and also the uh, person who could only see the right side of the visual field. Technically, have the, uh, the paralyzed person or persons like that ever seen video of themselves saying it, and does it change their perception or their future? when they realize that they, they, uh, they're confabulating. And then also for people who only see on the right side of the visual field, do we ever shift their view so that now their left side is now the right side? So that's one question. And second, um, this whole idea of the, um, the work memory being such a small subset of the, uh, the larger one, I, I, I wonder if you care to speculate on the evolutionary uh, rationale for such a non-parsimonious use of our brain for uh, something that we don't actually, as you say, work with. Thank you. Um, on one of the questions you mentioned, actually it was already answered in uh, Professor Gottlieb's talk. And uh, this is a famous um, experiment involving neglect patients in, in, uh, by Eduardo Bisiak, where they um, were asked to um, describe the Piazza del Duomo in Milan. And they were asked to describe it from the point of view of sitting in a certain cafe, and then they described the right side. <laughs> and then they were asked to describe it from the point of view of the opposite side of the square, they described the other side. So they have the representation of the whole thing. It's just that if they form an image, they only form an image of the, of the, of the right side. On the evolution story, I think um, at least part, look, uh, part of it is when we look around the world, there are lots of things that happen very quickly. You know, maybe the little flick of the tail of a predatory animal behind a rock or something. And it's a good thing to have a very rich visual field, parts of which you can home in on and focus on and think about and deliberate about. Um, so that's, that's at least part of the explanation. Another part of the explanation is that Contrary to what you thought about, what you said about um, uh, um, parsimoniousness, the, the human brain is an incredibly hot, incredible hodgepodge. Professor Gottlieb mentioned all those retinotopic areas in the visual system. Why do we have them? Because the way the system evolved is they just kept duplicating the retina. Um, <laughs> um, so it's a hodgepodge of stuff put together where a lot of the strange phenomena can only be understood as um, uh, just a, a result of what you have to, what, you, what, the, what happens when you build on something you've already got. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I pretty much agree yeah. with that. I mean, evolution very often produces uh, Ruby Goldberg machines, you know, these incredibly complicated things that all they do is to sharpen a pencil. So. Um, all right, well, we are out of time. Thanks very much again for uh, both of our speakers. Thank you for coming. Happy Darwin Day. Happy Darwin Day indeed. Um,
Again, thank you to the speakers. For more on the two organizations, you can pick up some information on the tables in the back. The Center for Inquiry is centerforinquiry.net forward slash NYC, and the New York City Skeptics is nycskeptics.org. Thank you again for coming. See you soon.